When I got into this uh, as a political cartoonist, uh, as a pro, I got syndicated in 1991. There were about 350 full-time editorial cartoonists in the United States. That was way down. Uh, there used to be 2,000 a century ago. Uh, but today, there's about 16. So let me begin first with a Ted Rule quote. Political cartooning may not pay well, or often at all, and media elites can ignore it all they want, but it matters, almost enough to die for. Ted Rawl is a syndicated cartoonist whose work appears in 100 newspapers around the United States. I'm delighted to introduce the talented and always opinionated Ted Rawl. Thank you, Mary. Uh, thank you uh, to the Cambridge Forum and uh, to uh, Mary Stack for inviting me here tonight. It's uh, awesome to be here. Uh, it's very exciting to uh, sort, of, sort of be back in uh, where I began. I was born at uh, Mount Auburn Hospital and uh, <laughs> uh, on a very hot day in late August, 1963. Uh, so I, will, I have a, Harvard, Cambridge has a special place in my heart, not to mention all the used bookstores. Um, and the Mexican restaurants where certain departments of Homeland Security chiefs are not allowed to eat. <laughs> um, so um, as, as Mary points out, uh, political cartooning is, um, in, is in trouble, uh, but at the same time it's very vibrant. I mean, uh, it, cartooning arguably goes back to uh, the to the cave drawings at Lascaux, France, and uh, there are uh, examples of political satire in pictorial form that go back to the Assyrian Empire that have been found, and no doubt most of this stuff was destroyed and lost, as no doubt most of my work will be by the, <laughs> after a few thousand years, if not sooner. Um, the, 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 what is going on with political cartooning in the United States today is kind of a perfect storm. Um, most political cartooning up until fairly recently was financed by and appeared in print media. Obviously, we all know what's happened to print newspapers, and they're in terrible trouble. In fact, I just saw a report that showed that uh, print newspaper readership dec is declining currently at about 14 to 15 percent per year. And that's part of a long-term trend. I mean, newspaper readership has actually been declining since 1960. Um, television started, was really the first thing to start putting a dent in newspapers. And then uh, for those of us who are old enough to remember when many, many towns had multiple newspapers, uh, a morning and an afternoon paper, paper at least in a typical American city. Um, now, uh, peaking out, for example, in New York City in 1960, there were 28 daily newspapers. Uh, and today there are uh, three, and um, they're and they're all in in big trouble. The New York Times had to uh, take get a big loan from a somewhat disreputable billionaire a few years ago just to stay afloat. Uh, the Daily News is barely hanging on by a thread owned by a uh, Chicago-based company that I'm not very fond of called Tronk, uh, for, formerly Tribune Publishing, again to be Tribune Publishing. The chaos in the uh, in the in the world of print media is. Is, a, is extreme, and then, uh, and then as if that's not bad enough, uh, there, the few of us who are left are being targeted. Um, uh, some of my colleagues in France, as was mentioned at Charlie Hebdo, uh, with violence. Uh, that's happened in the United States, too. There was a gathering of right-wing political cartoonists in Garland, Texas, that was targeted uh, for, by ISIS. Uh, it's an, an event that was kind of forgotten, but two ISIS gunmen showed up heavily armed and uh, were shot at the entrance of this uh, cartooning gathering a few years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, quite frankly, and I'm a little ashamed to say so, many of those of us on the left, of whom I count myself proudly, didn't have much to say about that. And that's still a threat to freedom of expression, uh, even if it is against, uh, in this case, racist cartoonists. Um, it's, uh, nevertheless, it's, it's a scary time. Uh, and there's also the, um, the, the case of Rob Rogers, which is super interesting, actually, because um, when I got into this uh, as a political cartoonist, uh, as a pro, I got syndicated in 1991. There were about 350 full-time editorial cartoonists in the United States. That was way down. Uh, there used to be 2,000 a century ago. 
Uh, but today there's about 16, uh, depending on how you count them. I'm one of them, the last of the Mohicans here. Um, at, believe it or not, at 55 years old, I will be in August, uh, I'm one of the youngest political cartoonists in the United States. Um, there are only three who are younger than me, and they're, it's, it's doubtful that they'll be able to hang on for very long. Um, there just isn't much. There's a far more vibrant political cartooning seen in like Iran, for example, uh, or in, there, are, there are far more of them in countries like Zambia. Um, the, the United States is a country that has pretty much uh, gone after this field and this profession uh, pretty badly. And Rob is the, Rob Rogers at the Pittsburgh Post Gazette, a friend, a colleague of mine, is the latest victim. And what's interesting about his case is that um, for the last two years since Trump took over, there's been a lot of um, fear that uh, his rhetoric of, uh, of, of, of criticizing the media as fake news was going to lead to censorship within the media. But the truth is that we haven't really seen that censorship uh, among traditional liberal news outlets until the case of Rob Rogers. Um, Rob Rogers uh, worked the, Postburg, the Pittsburgh Post Gazette is a is an interesting paper. It's all it's historically a democratic paper. Its editorial page has been historically liberal and pro union, and um, until fairly recently, if people remember Richard Mellon Scaife, uh, he owned a paper uh, in the town of Greensburg, Pennsylvania, which is near Pittsburgh, and uh, he, they they changed their name to the Pittsburgh Union Review. Scaife fund poured millions of dollars into this newspaper to try to take over the Pittsburgh market and turn it into uh, sort of the Fox News in print of Pittsburgh. What's interesting is he failed. The paper ended up having to withdraw its circulation and distribution from the metro Pittsburgh area and crawled back like a, like a wretch uh, into the rock of Greensburg. But uh, so the Pittsburgh Post uh, Gazette remained as the vi proud victor, the liberal victor in this newspaper war, and uh, and yet in the end the right wing triumphed. The uh, the the old publisher, who also publishes the Toledo Blade, which is a very conservative paper, made a political decision two years ago to shift the paper to the right. He said, "Well, Trump won, so that's now the new paradigm of American politics. So we need to switch our editorial page over to the right." So. He brought in a guy from Toledo, uh, editorial director, to basically serve as Rob's hatchet man. And in basically the, probably the most poorly handled firing uh, that I've seen in my life. And you know, we live in America. People get poorly fired every day. Um, I've been poorly fired myself. And I'm willing to talk about it if anyone wants to. Um, the, uh, the, he was like, first he went into, uh, when the new guy came in, he showed him a cartoon. He's like, I don't like that cartoon. Show me another one. I don't like that cartoon either. Show me another one. Show me another one. Show me another one. The editor killed 19 cartoons in a row, which was, he'd been working there for 25 years. Typically, he got one cartoon or two cartoons killed a year. Uh, this guy's doing, you know, 200 cartoons a year. So obviously, it was kind of like, well, I don't really like any of your cartoons. And instead of just saying, look, we're a right wing paper now, uh, here's two years' salary, thanks for your service, goodbye, uh, they just kind of were trying to get him to quit. And he had really no choice but to speak out, Rob did, because um, you know it's a newspaper and people are paying attention and suddenly he's not appearing and people are asking questions, so he did. And then it became this big national story, it's been all over CNN, the, he, the New York Times, uh, NPR. And, um, and so what's really interesting is that today Rob Rogers is a more widely read uh, cartoonist than he ever was at the Pittsburgh <laughs> Post-Gazette. <laughs> Uh, because when you're in the New York Times and on NPR and on CNN, uh, people suddenly know you're alive. And so he's all over social media. He wasn't that great at social media before. He used to have a blog that had like uh, three or four entries a year when you should really have three or four a day. Uh, he didn't do much before. But now, uh, you know, the last time I checked, he did a cartoon online. It was like 11,000 retweets. I'm like, you asshole. How, <laughs> like... Can I, like, can I get fired like you? And, um, and uh, you know, Charlie Ebdo uh, is another example. I mean, unfortunately, nothing can bring back my colleagues of whom I actually knew a few of them, but uh, the paper is more vibrant than ever. It's before the um, mass shooting in Paris, uh, it was on the verge of bankruptcy. The paper was really on the way out. 
Uh, but now circulation is probably five, six times more than it was at the time. People are paying attention there. And I think, uh, you know, in this world of hyper-saturated, uh, uh, you know, re we're all reading a million apps and, uh, you know, the, 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 there's so much media to consume, it's easy to forget that some legacy media stuff exists and, and maybe we forget to appreciate it until it's gone. And we're like, oh my God, uh, I can't believe that happened and now it's gone. And that's kind of what happened with Rob. And so in this little parable, you kind of have um, the two, and I, I guess I could maybe even throw myself in that too. I mean, um, I was fired a f uh, three years ago by the LA Times in, and I'm suing them for uh, defamation and libel uh, and, and uh, wrongful termination. Um, it was done as a favor to the LAPD and to the chief of police at the time. Uh, the newspaper was engaged in a highly corrupt business deal where the LAPD pension fund had purchased the parent company of the LA Times and 14 other newspapers. In my view, this should be against the law. Uh, I don't think a government agency should be allowed to own a newspaper in the United States, but in this case, it did, and nobody knew about it. The readers of the, L of the Los Angeles Times to this day still don't know that. And um, so anyway, they, they made some stuff up about me and fired me, and I'm suing them to clear my name. Um, and I would say that this, the coverage that came out of that and the notoriety and the support that I got from the community has probably made my work uh, reach a broader audience than it ever did before. So what we have here with the Rogers parable is sort of the, the grim, you know, it's two sides of the same coin. This is about disruption. It's about print media going away and the online uh, world taking over. And in some cases, even maybe even saving your career. Like for example, uh, when the stuff started happening with the LA Times, um, I was able to go kind of like our president directly to the people. When they libeled me, I was able to go on Twitter and Facebook and spread the word about what had actually happened. And I kept in touch with my readers that way. And it, they were incredibly supportive, even to the point of I was able to raise $85,000 via a GoFundMe because the LA Times required me to post a $75,000 bond just to, to start my case um, because I'm an out-of-state plaintiff. California has a stupid law, which is unconstitutional, uh, that says that if you're an out-of-state, it is, it's an, it's an unconstitutional law, out-of-state uh, plaintiff, uh, you, you have to file a bond if, if the defendant asks you to. So I was supposed, they wanted $300,000. And I'm like, you, you guys only paid me 300 a week, okay? So <laughs> I'm not gonna live that long to be able to pay your bond. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting um, world to live in. And I have to say, um, it's an important, it is an, I do think that quote that Mary cited is important because it's, it is a very, uh, it's an important medium. You know, I think there's no, uh, no one here would, it would be insane to say, for example, that, uh, that news reporting and analysis in words is no longer relevant and we shouldn't have anymore. No one would say that. Well, it, we're, news analysis and commentary and satire in pictures is also an important distribution channel, and it does stuff that words can't do. And I do a column, and I do, and I do cartoons, because they both have different applications. They, they each have different purposes, they have different effects, and they're, they do different things in the way that you can, achieve, that you can reach people. So I think th the tricky part for people like me is to not become like NPR during Pledge Week. You know, <laughs> like, it's not a guilt thing. It's not like, and, and when I, I used to be president of the Association of American Editorial Cartoonists, and one of the things that w like my predecessors did and some of my successors has been like, you know, feel sorry for us. Like we whined, like every time one of us was fired, we'd be like, it's so unfair. And, and I would be, that would make my skin crawl because like, you know, most Americans have lost their jobs unfairly at some point in their lives, uh, or at least are close to someone who has. See, we're not special that way. Like, we're all suffering disruption. And, and what, but, so it's, it's not that you should, like, read our cartoons or support our work or go to our GoFundMe pages because, like, you should feel sorry for us. It's because, or, you know, it's because actually the work's really, there's, like, a lot of really interesting, cool work out there. And um, that sort of brings me to, the topic of uh, some of the books that are in the, on sale in the pack. Um, so one of the things that uh, 
this disruption has forced us to do and has made the difference between the 16 of us who are still around and the hundreds who are not is adaptability and able to and trying new things and trying to uh, figure out new ways to reach the public. And so, for example, um, there were a lot of experiments with uh, animated cartoons, and I've done some too. Uh, unfortunately, there just doesn't seem to be any media outlets that are willing to pay for them. Uh, they don't really cost that much, but it, you know, it, you need to you need about a thousand dollars for a, a two-minute animation, and most media outlets don't want to pay for that. So. There's only one cartoonist in America who really can do them with any kind of success. His name is Mark Fiore, and he's great, and it's a full-time career for him, and he won a Pulitzer Prize for them, which is awesome. Uh, there's, um, and in my case, uh, I started doing working in the graphic novel form and comics journalism form back in the mid-'90s because it just seemed like really cool, and there was stuff you could do that you couldn't do in other formats. And, um, a few years ago, I sort of blundered into what I'm doing these days, which is uh, I'll keep doing until I get tired of them, um, the graphic novel biography format. Um, I was um, necessarily critical. It's the, the, I think it's sort of inherent to the idea of editorial satire is that you're constantly making fun of people. And, uh, you know, I, I dug out my first grade report card the other day, and uh, the comment from the teacher written in, in pencil in 1968 said, uh, Frederick, which is my legal name, said, Frederick has an uncanny ability to, uh, to, to hone in on each child's Achilles heel and reduce him or her to tears. <laughs> it's like, and I have to say when I read that, I was not ashamed. <laughs> I, I think Ms. Taylor was extremely per, uh, perspicacious uh, and perceptive. So, uh, so, so the thing is, um, the, uh, one of the things that I tried to do, in, uh, like I was constantly being told and complained about, and my fans would say, why don't you ever do anything positive? Don't you have any heroes, any role models? People at Q&As would say, like, who's your favorite president? And I'm like, well, they're all scum, so none. <laughs> um, it's, I mean, <laughs> sorry. And, uh, and, and I mean, I love history. I know they're all scum. So the, um, so I was, so it was like, then, like uh, the Edward Snowden story broke in uh, 2014, and uh, I thought, like you know, here's a guy who actually did the right thing. Here's a guy who uh, he he fits every bill of what Ted Raw looks for in a hero. He a, a person with integrity who takes chances, who does the right thing, even though it's going to hit, hurt him or her personally. Um, and so I thought, this is a, a story I really want to tell, and I think. I wanted to tell the story in a non-pedantic way. I didn't want to say, okay, so th if you're working at, say, these days, ICE, you should quit and steal documents and give them to the media. You should, actually. That's the moral thing to do. If you don't, you're scum. Um, but like, if you, uh, but I wanted to just sort of tell the story and be like, look, here's this biography. By the way, a year passed between those events and the time I started working on the book, and no one had published any biography of Snowden, which just was, to me, like gobsmacking. There was a, uh, there was a book about the documents, two of them, uh, and Greenwald did a book, but they, not a biography. And I was like, where'd this guy come from? Like, why did he make this decision? Like, you know, what, what was it that made, you know, at the time, there were tens of thousands of people who saw the same documents and they sat on them and they went home every day to their children and their and their spouses and their partners and kissed them and went to bed and had sex and they thought they were good people and then there's like this and then Edward Snowden's like no this is wrong and he was a right winger he started out as a right winger he's like I'm gonna I'm gonna change this up I'm gonna uh, take a new direction I'm gonna flee and I'm gonna go on the lamb and I'm gonna and, I, and even if they kill me that's fine um, so what, why was he different? So I sought to answer that question, and um, so I did this uh, biography, which is still kind of the only Edward Snowden biography, really, and uh, it was successful, and so, uh, in other words, it sold lots of books. It doesn't mean that it was any good, uh, but it was successful, <laughs> because we live in capitalism, and um, so when you're successful, your publisher always comes back and says, like, do you have another one just like that, but better, more successful? So. 
Around the same time, um, I sort of did the Hail Mary pass. Bernie Sanders had just announced for president. He, had, he was running 2% in the Democratic primaries at that point when he first announced. And I just had a very strong instinct about him because I had been uh, following his career for all of my life. And I just thought he was a fascinating character. And I thought his, you know, he was like the guy who'd been telling the same story that the country was finally catching up to. And I was like, well, I told my publisher, look, this is either gonna go gangbusters or it's gonna die a dog's death because he's gonna drop out of the primaries like in, no, in like March. So, but let me do it. And he was like, let's just do it. And uh, so we did it and it became a New York Times bestseller. It was a, you know, a very successful. My publisher was very pleased. I was very pleased. Um, and so then uh, you know, we were like, so who should be next in our, in our trilogy of positive change makers? So naturally we turned to Donald Trump. <laughs> That's not really true. Um, Pope Francis is the, is the, is the real, the, the, we did a little detour and I kind of symbolized that with the black cover of the Trump book, uh, which also is, looks a little different from the other ones. It's a homage to one of Hitler's uh, election posters from 1932, uh, where it's just a photo of Hitler on a, on a black background that just has Hitler across. So I'm trying to signify that like, I don't really like this guy. But I was also trying to give the devil his due and tell this, this story. It's a very different approach because uh, you know, a book, a proper biography of Trump in this format would have to be 2,000 pages long because he's had a very long uh, history and he's, he's got, there's a lot to document. I mean, you know, Edward Snowden was 29 when he stole all that stuff. He didn't, hadn't done that much. He never even graduated from high school. So uh, it's uh, you know, kind of like a, a, a completely different kind of narrative. So with Trump, that's more of an extended editorial cartoon, and it's kind of focusing on some key stories. And uh, you know, at the time, I will say, I knew he was going to win, and um, there was no doubt in my mind because uh, even though I'm born here, um, and this is something I'm really angry about, I would have really much rather been raised here in in Cambridge or Boston. But my dad, um, who gave me part of my asshole genes, um, like. <laughs> Worked at a in the military, and he was a he he was a fellow at MIT, a Sloan fellow at MIT, uh, and he pissed off a general, so he got demoted to Dayton, Ohio, which is where I grew up, and uh, Dayton, Ohio, is the swing st city in the swing state. Uh, you know, in fact, you could just have Dayton vote every presidential election; you get exactly the same results. The rest of us could just not vote, and it would be the same results uh, for real. And um, and I remember every time before every election, I could always go back to New York and tell and report from flyover country, like, like I can tell you who's going to win, right? No matter what, based on the yard signs. And um, before 20, and in the, I remember in 2016, all I saw were Trump signs and no Hillary signs. And I was like, okay, well that's done. I went to sleep at 8:45 on election night. Uh, I knew he was going to win, um, and I called it in February. So the. Trump, so that's, so that's kind of like, I just had to do the Trump book. It didn't do as well because Ted Rall fans don't like Donald Trump. Donald Trump fans don't like Ted Rall. My, my, my publisher was pissed. So he's like, so then he's like, okay, we got to go back to doing the positive ones. So I'm like, so we're like, who, who, who? It's, I mean, by the way, what does it say about our system that it's so hard to come up with good people? And so we had, I had to import one from Italy uh, by way of Argentina. Um, so, um, I, so, so Pope Francis uh, was like, it seemed like a good choice because he was coming up, he was gonna, by the time the book came out, it was gonna be the fifth anniversary of his papacy, uh, and that's the day that it was released. And, um, and I just thought like, you know, there was a lot of hubbub about him the first year or two after he uh, ascended to the, he was named pontiff, but then kind of people sort of started taking him for granted. And I thought, well, you know, that's kind of wrong. He's a remarkable dude, and because, he kind of violates one of my core principles, which is that words aren't enough. You know, I mean, like to me, like politics is in the street. It's like, it's, you know, I grew up in the, I was when I was a little kid, it was the 60s and early 70s. I mean, to me, that's where activism takes place. And just me, 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 talking doesn't do it. It's like, it's not enough. But maybe if you're Pope, you know, it's different. Like, so when the Pope says that like gay people aren't bad, that is big. Uh, you know, when the Pope says that uh, a, long, a, a huge category of people have been wronged and, re and redress needs to be made, 
that's important. When the Pope addresses climate change, it means more. Not to say that he was the first Pope to address climate change, that's not true. But when he says it, it means more. So um, what I was interested in as I delved into Pope Francis's uh, a story was, you know, kind of like where he came from. And then very quickly, I realized that for me, the big story was going to have to be the dirty war in Argentina. And um, that, to me, was a, it ended up becoming a really, I read this one, one story that just, as I was raised Catholic, that just made me uh, completely, made the book come together. You know, the, when you write or draw a book, it's it's often, it's hard to get, find a way in is the best. I just recently read uh, Seymour Hersh's excellent uh, autobiography called Reporter, and he ta was talking about how it's hard to find a way in to a story or a book sometimes. And then things, and it either just dies a dog's death or it clicks. And, and for me, the, what clicked with Francis was this narrative of these two Jesuit priests who uh, were working in the barrio and the junta came to him and demanded that he uh, pull the, the, these priests out of the barrio because that was considered liberation theology. It was socialist. Uh, the junta was right wing. And uh, so he defrocked these two priests and they lost their protection uh, with the junta uh, of the, the protection of the Catholic Church. And they were kidnapped and uh, nearly killed. They were tortured almost to death, drugged. Uh, barely made it out, and then actually Francis did intercede to get them out before they were killed. Um, and it, it chastened him, and the, the, the Jesuit order in Argentina really turned against him, um, and they were furious. And to this day, the, it's not all forgiven by any means. Um, so even though he's the first Jesuit pope, he's like not Mr. Popular among the Jesuits. But nevertheless, um, he has spent most of his life trying to atone in some respect and moving to the left politically uh, for, what he, for, for that action. And most notably, there was an, there was a, he went to celebrate mass. Uh, he showed up unannounced with uh, the two priests, the two victims, and he Prostrated, prostrated himself in front of everybody and begged forgiveness there. And he was the cardinal at the time, um, you know, and uh, of Buenos Aires. This was a big deal. And I thought like, you know, like that's, like where are the, where are the American leaders like that? You know, I mean, I mean really, truly, I mean, you could name any single one, man, they have a lot of apologies to make, like, you know, to, God, Trump could, needs to live to be like 300 to do all the apologies. And, but I would say the same about all of them. And it's, um, you know, I just thought like, well, that's, that's integrity. And I thought, you know, as a Catholic, I just went immediately to the sacrament of confession, which is the major defining difference between Amer the, uh, the rites of Catholicism and non-Catholic uh, Christian sects in the United States. Uh, it's the one thing. It's sacrament, it's penance is different. It's you confess, you beg for mercy, uh, you, it, you apologize, you atone, and you try to make it right. Um, that's a big part of, even though I'm, I don't believe in God anymore, I still believe in that. And I think that's a really important thing um, for, you know, I think it's basically human ethics. Um, and he did that. And I just thought, so, Pope, so the Francis' story is kind of the story of what, Catholicism is all about. So that's how the book kind of came together for me. I, I realized that while I was working on it and people were talking to me about the book, they're like, well, you know, I don't know that much about Catholicism, a lot of like non-Catholics told me. And I was like, you know, I, I'm gonna have to kind of do a tutorial on that in the book. And at, then at the same time, um, you know, tell Francis's story and do it all in like 240 pages with like a lot of pictures. So, uh, you know, it's very condensed, um, for sure. It's like a dark star. Uh, but it's, but I think, it, you know, I think it worked out well. I'm really happy with the way it worked out. Um, I don't know yet if it's going to be successful as my, my uh, but I'm currently working on actually another book. My next book is uh, going to be, uh, kind of has a um, local uh, relationship. It's about Aaron Swartz, uh, the uh, Reddit, um, person who uh, committed suicide after he, um, uh, he uh, hacked into the JSTOR databases because he believed information and particularly academ academic papers needed to be free. And uh, so that was kind of assigned to me by my publisher. Uh, it, 
I, I'm a little hesitant about how to get into this story because he did commit suicide and that's not a positive change maker example that we need anyone to follow, obviously, but at the same time he was a really interesting troubled young man and uh, just because someone comes to an untimely end doesn't mean that their story is not worth telling or that they should be disappeared like a Soviet, Soviet apparatchik from the top of Lenin's tomb on May Day. So, um, so I think it's, uh, you know, I, I think he deserves a good, uh, a, a good biography, so hopefully I'll give him one. And um, so, but the, the thing about these, these books is uh, I've kind of found a niche. And um, I think that with any kind of person trying to survive in media these days, I don't really care about what kind of media it is, not just journalism or satire, uh, you really need that. You need to figure out something that's, you can't just do what everyone else does. When I started um, drawing cartoons, almost every editorial cartoonist in America drove, uh, drew somewhat like Jeff McNally, the uh, cartoonist at the Chicago Tribune, or uh, Pat Oliphant, um, the Australian cartoonist uh, who was widely syndicated and they called it the Alinelli style. And, and you know it if you were around back then, it's like lots of cross hatching, donkeys, elephants. Uh, there's a particular look, McNally always loved like big complicated like objects, like machines, like tanks or aircraft carriers. And they looked so cool. And he would just draw them like he didn't even have like a photo reference. They were just like out of his crazy brain. And uh, he was just like, it was crazy. He also did like, he was, he was very prolific. He also had a, a comic strip called Shoe. But anyway, everyone was trying to copy him. And um, Mary mentioned uh, my Pulitzer finalist ship, right? Well, I, the reason that was a finalist ship and not a winner is because, and I've never told this story in public, but what the hell, um, was that uh, Columbia University, where, which awards the Pulitzers, uh, and should have shown some favoritism to me, who graduated from there, but did not, um, and I am pissed about that. Uh, they, they literally, um, so, so they sent up three finalists, and uh, it was me and two other guys, and I'm gonna say guys, because frankly, most political cartoonists are men, um, and uh, unfortunately, and they, the other two guys had previously won. And back then, there was an informal rule that they, did, they didn't want to give repeated uh, Pulitzers to anyone who'd previously won. So my friends all called me. They heard I was a finalist. They're like, congratulations, Ted. Champagne was delivered to my house. And, <laughs> and uh, so for about six hours, uh, in a, on a Tuesday in April 1997, I was a Pulitzer winner. And then uh, Seymour Topping, the head, the dean of journalism at Columbia University, uh, stepped in and was like, no, 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 no. Ted Rawl doesn't draw like a political cartoonist. Ted Rawl, it's like you, you, you have to draw like in the Alinelli style. He draws different, and he was like, ixnay. So literally, they pulled uh, uh, Jim Moran's name out of thin air. He hadn't even applied. And, uh, and they gave it to him, which they can do. There's all sorts of weird shenanigans on the Pulitzers. And, and you know, I, I, for years, I was incredibly bitter about that. And as you can tell, I'm completely over it now. <laughs> and, but it is true that I would not be standing here today if he had not done that. Because if I had drawn, um, if I had drawn like these other guys, I would have won a Pulitzer. And like those guys, I would be unemployed today. Because, I, because all the people who drew exactly the same are done. All the people who have unique drawing styles and have unique approaches are still around. And, um, and so I think originality still is the most important thing. I don't care what field you're working in. Um, there's a huge drive for conformity. But conformity is not just like, uh, it's not just boring. It's actually career suicide. And uh, in, in an age of disruption, and we're in an age of disruption. So with that, um, I guess uh, I've bladdered along a lot, and I much prefer Q&A, so I hope you're okay with uh, having your voice broadcast by WGBH uh, to millions and millions of people uh, around the world, all of whom will be making fun of you <laughs> while they hear you. But, uh, and I promise to be nice, though. Before people come up with ideas, um, I've got, couple of questions myself. So your background was engineering and nuclear physics. Right. Uh, <laughs> what advice do you give to a young aspiring satirical cartoonist? Uh, don't major in <laughs> physics, applied <laughs> physics and nuclear engineering. Um, actually, best advice I would give is um, study history. Um, I think history is missing from uh, 
the context of a lot of political satirists. They can't draw on it. And it's, it's very unusual, right? I mean, if you think about like satire in other countries, there's always a historical context. I mean, like China is an extreme example. They have these satirical puppet shows and satirical car and funny cartoons that draw on stuff that happened 4,000 years ago. Um, but, but like even in like say in England, if you think of Monty Python, there's all these historical references. Um, it's really rich. And you know, just even being able to say, hey, this happened before really helps you. I mean, even, I mean, America is the most ahistorical society, I think, on earth. And like you have this, um, you know, people don't even remember what happened five years ago. So if you're even able to say like, well, you know, actually, Obama deported more people uh, from the, from the US-Mexico border than all other US presidents combined, and that's true. They're like, they're like really? It's like, so it's like, you can say, well, look, or like when people say like, oh, you know, of uh, separating kids from their families, that's not the American way. I'm like, really? Never heard of slavery? It's like, uh, you, you know, you, you never heard of, you never heard of, uh, you know, the, 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 what happened to the Native Americans having their babies ripped away from them? I mean, this is like, so if you have that knowledge of history, it really helps you, as opposed to just being able to, just being like, it is sad when kids are crying, which is unfortunately what a lot of, like, you know, commentary boils down to. So my best advice is study history or read history. Just read it. So um, when you were a smart aleck at school, mm. did you have any friends? <laughs> um, so it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's like the answer is sometimes none at all and sometimes everybody. It just depended on the context. It's kind of like how Bernie Sanders was a weirdo from Vermont until suddenly he's like the most popular uh, politician in America, which he is today. Um, it's, you know, it, it's if the times catch up to you, if you're in the right place. In high school, I was wildly popular. Um, in, in elementary school, I was completely ostracized. But I went to kind of a hillbilly high school, uh, elementary school. So, um, you know, we're like having brown hair was unusual. It was like Village of the Damned. Everyone was, sorry, everyone was blonde. And it was kind of freaky. And again, I'm completely over that now. But, but, uh, but no, I was, it, it, it was definitely, uh, it depends. It just depends. I think if you, I think if you have, uh, if you rely on satire for, um, if, you, if you're a jokester and you're a prankster, people love you or they hate you. And that's just how it is. And it, like, you know, if you, I, I was kind of like really taken by this, uh, this friend of mine who was a huge fan of George Carlin one time, you guys are gonna totally, this isn't live, right? You're totally gonna like bleep me out because I'm gonna, I'm gonna drop an F-bomb. So he, George Carlin had, uh, so she said, my friend said like she loved George Carlin. She'd loved him for years, bought all his albums, seen him in concert many times. And then one time he, uh, he told a joke that just pissed her off so much that she just decided he was dead to her. And I said, well, of course, I, was like, I have to know what this joke is. And here's the joke. The joke is, have you ever noticed that women who are against abortion you wouldn't, are women you wouldn't want to f anyway? And, <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> and okay. And the point is, I was like, okay, I'm not even going to judge whether that joke crosses any kind of line. Let's just stipulate it's disgusting and misogynist and sexist uh, and lookist stipulated. But still, I was like, this guy's like on a high, comedy's a high wire act. I mean, you know, he's telling thousands of jokes a year. It's like, the guy like screws up one time and he's dead to you? And, and she's like, yes. And I was like, and I was like, then I'm dead. Like, and so I, I stopped caring. It was like, and you, if you care, you're just like not, you know, you can't do your job. But if you don't care, you're eventually going to get fired and ostracized and hated. That's, that is the, when you go into this, it's like, you know that. It's a, it's a suicide pact. So this, this kind of conundrum exists in your head because mm. in, in, in order to, to take something apart, you have to be able to be a kind of a, a litmus test for society's conscience. You yeah. almost have to be able to read the national pulse. Yeah. And so you have to really be at heart an idealist. Absolutely. Yeah, well, to be, I, I think that's right. I mean, you know, like, look, you have to tell people a lot of uncomfortable truths if you're going to be a good political satirist. Um, you know, if you want to be popular and make millions of dollars, then you have to be Jay Leno. But if you want to be funny and, and important, then you've got to tell people the truth that, like, for example, the United States is a terrible country. You know, I mean, just awful. 
and that we have no business talking down to anyone else. You know, we're no shining, we're, we're a shining city in a toilet, you know? <laughs> and like, people don't wanna hear that because it's like, hey, this is the country I live in and I pay taxes and it kind of sucks to live in a, you know, to be like a, you know, a good German in Nazi Germany, but that's the reality. And you know, you just, it's, you just can't care. Um, and people are gonna like you or, they, or they're not. I mean, like, um, I went through really rough times uh, after 9-11. Uh, you know, uh, up on 9 when 9-11 happened, I was riding spectacularly high. I was in Time, Fortune, Forbes, uh, Bloomberg ma ma uh, Magazine. I was in over 200 newspapers. I was making a nice quarter of a million dollar a year salary. And, uh, and literally on 9-11, I was on my way to Philadelphia to pick up a five and a half million dollar check to start a Brooklyn alternative weekly newspaper. So I was riding high. So fuck you, Osama bin Laden. And then, and then um, the, the thing is that then, like within weeks, it all started to fall apart. The, my editor at Time called and said, we're not running humor anymore because no one will ever want to laugh again. The guy, the guy, the, the, the guy in Philly, the investor, said, no one will ever do business in New York again. And I was like, they do business in Hiroshima. And then it's, it's like, you know, I mean, there's just like, it's just like Fortune like fired all their cartoonists. Um, everybody, everybody was out of work. The syndicates, the syndica the syndicates were getting like just overrun with cancellations. And my salary, my income dropped by three quarters in six months. And it took ten years to just start to crawl back. Never, of course, got close to it the way it used to be. And it's like never going to be in like big publications. Like those publications don't print any cartoons. It's not like they don't like Ted Rawl. They just don't like cartoons. And um, so it's, you know, you, you're sort of like, things can change just like that, you know? Just think, you know, Peter Max was a big deal one day, and then suddenly he wasn't. I mean, and that's kind of like, that's what like art is. Like if you're a novelist or a poet or an, or an actor even, it's like, you can just fall out of fashion. You're disposable, you know? American culture is, is, is not like, we're not like the French, you know, where Johnny Holiday was like worshiped forever. Um, you know, I love France. It's like, you know, it's not like that here. You're just, you know, but, but it's the only thing I ever loved doing. So that's why I do it. I mean, I've, I've been a banker. I've driven a taxi. I've uh, been a financial analyst. I've, uh, I've, I was the worst waiter in New York City. Um, and, uh, but I've done lots of stuff. It's the only thing I liked. Okay, so we, we established that you were sort of an idealist. Totally. But you call yourself a subversive. So, do you think that's really important to have in democracy? Subversives. If you know, there's always a, do a dominant paradigm in, um, in in any kind of society, and it has it relies on certain shibboleths that are some are true, others not so true. And if you don't have a cast of people who are um, satirists and just social critics and activists. And, uh, and anarchists and uh, people who are trying to undermine or criticize, like you're never, first of all, that society can't be vibrant and can never even reform itself. But it's, so forget, it's doomed really to revolution in the future. Um, it's, but even aside from that, um, if you don't have that, like uh, I think there's no hope for improvement in the future. I mean, the, the powers that be, don't wake up in the morning and like, you know, there's even like the, you know, like Democrats in Congress, they don't wake up in the morning and think, holy crap, there's tons of people sleeping outside every night and this is America. They don't give two blankety blanks. They don't care, they don't care. They might care in some abstracted way, but they don't care like the way you care, like when your bills are like unpaid, like you care and it's like the, it's so that's up to people, you know, that's up to us to raise hell and, uh, and call, call their attention to this stuff. Otherwise, nothing's ever gonna get better, ever. I mean, honestly, it's like uh, satirists and um, I'm not saying this about myself, although it's self-interested. I mean, I'm a fan of this, of this medium that I'm in and it has endless potential. I mean, can you imagine, for example, if like say powerful media outlets like NPR and the New York Times and the Boston Globe and, uh, and, and CBS News. Put like, like people who were like on the far left critiquing society 
on the air and in print and, and in, in drawings routinely. It would broaden the conversation and it would just, and on the far right, by the way, and it would just allow the full spectrum of ideas to be exposed and discussed. In fact, but instead we're in this like really narrow casted band of self-censored, bland, middle of the road, DNC, DLC, centrist, corporatist crap. And, uh, and you know, it's, it, it's, it's not good for society. It's not even really good for, say, the Democratic Party. It's not even good for these media outlets. They, they're all leaving money on the table. They would, set, they, would, they would have bigger, I guarantee you that print media wouldn't be in as much trouble today if it, was more, if it was, wasn't as boring. So, a last question for you. The um, bad joke your friend talked to you that turned her off George Carlin. Mm. So, um, as a cartoonist, can you ever go too far and have you been guilty of doing something you wished you hadn't done? Is there a cartoon you regret? Uh, yeah, many, I mean... I, or many? Yeah, I mean, of, of, first of all, okay, Ide ideologically, there is no way you can go too far, ideologically. I mean, if you can come up with a great Holocaust joke, you should make it. I personally don't know one, but if you can, you should do it. You should, I mean, art should like shoot for the stars. It's a high wire act. You should like be like Philippe Petit, going for gusto, make it happen, um, you know, and take risks. If you don't take risks, you're gonna suck. But, you know, and then you're gonna fall sometimes. And, and that's just, that's as it should be. But I think um, in terms of, you're going to fall <laughs> sometimes. And, you know, I, and I think about, there's cartoons that uh, I would just do over, a lot of them I would just do over just because of the execution. Um, you just, just could have been better. You know, it's like you're on a deadline and it's like, oh my God, like, oh, I forgot to do this. I should have done that. This could have been clearer. This drawing could have been better, whatever. But then there's, I think what you're getting at is more like stuff, issues of taste. Like, should you have a poor one? Yeah. Yeah, like for example, okay, so a classic example for me is uh, the day that George W. Bush was reelected in 2004, um, I did a really shitty cartoon. I did a, a cartoon um, where I was trying to go for a metaphor. Metaphors are always dangerous. And um, I was trying to do, a, so I kind of had the American public as like, or the, or the American society as a classroom. And I compared the classroom with like mainstreaming of, of, uh, of, of disadvantaged kids. And, it, and basically I compared Bush as having been, as basically putting the, main, the, the mainstreamed kid in charge of the class. And this was understandably, I mean, I wasn't thinking about like the kids, I was just thinking about how much I hated George W. Bush and what an idiot he was, and, and how crazy it was that he had been reelected after like losing the war in Iraq, but um, you know, and destroying the economy and just being, a, 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 you know, legalizing torture and just generally being a bad person. And the thing is that I started getting these complaints from parents and of disabled children, and I was like, oh man, like I screwed up big time. And then I made my second mistake, which is I issued a public apology and retraction. I will never do that again. I, I lost the Washington Post. They, would, they were holding tight. Everyone was holding tight with me until I apologized. Then they all threw me under the bus. And to, when Trump doesn't apologize, he's right. It's like in America, it's being apolog apologizing is like foolish. It's like, you should never apologize. I know I just said earlier, you should apologize. Yeah, but, I thought that was Pope Francis. But, but, if, but, if you, but it's the right thing to do, but not if you care about your career. Uh -huh. So like, um, I think it was a, um, you know, it was, it was bad. It was like, I really, I mean, it was the, I'm, I'm not sorry I did, but I know that it was not like smart. And, uh, you know, and, and that's, that's kind of crappy, right? You should be able to screw up and be like, oh my God, I shouldn't have done that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and you should be able to be like, you know, my bad. I mean, we all screw up, we're humans. And I, you know, I mean, th and there's uh, lots of other stuff like that. I mean, I did this very uh, controversial cartoon about Pat Tillman um, where, uh, you know, he was the uh, football player who died in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And the mistake there, and I kind of corrected this in the future, was that, like that in this cartoon I did, very controversial cartoon called Terror Widows, was that I kind of assumed that everybody watches as much news as I do. And that's just not true. People work like 50 hours a week. So, um, so if people understood the background, the cartoons would not have been very controversial, but, but they didn't understand it. So now one of the things I have to do as a cartoonist is tee up the, the story in the cartoon. I'll be like, so this happened. And then in the caption, and then I'll show like my response to it. Uh, in the, when I started drawing cartoons as a 
teenager and, and, and then in my 20s, you didn't have to do that because everyone's just reading the same news. You're, there's only four TV networks through broadcasting news. Every, you know, if a story's big, everyone's heard of it. And if they're seeing it in a newspaper, the odds are they're, they're familiar with the news. But that's not true anymore. Like now, a cartoon might just pop onto their cell phone and they don't have, in, and completely out of context, where someone's reading it who never reads the news. So you better have the news story in that cartoon. Okay, I welcome people to come up with questions. So, thanks, Ted. I, I met you at the Left Forum once a few years ago. I appreciate your work. Thank you. A um, couple quick questions. Mm -hmm. Is there a boycott being organized in the Pittsburgh area of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, as I hope there is? Secondly, have you considered doing a pictorial a graphic biography of Julian Assange? Mm -hmm. And could you say a little more about this in you know, this LAPD, your battle with the LA Times and the role of the LAPD behind the scenes. Okay, so, so in terms, I don't, I, you know, I don't, I'm in touch with Rob. Um, you know, surprisingly, a lot of cartoonists call me when they have a, a PR crisis. I can't imagine why that would be, um, but, they, uh, but they do, and because uh, I have a little experience in those matters. And, the, um, but I do think that, uh, but, but I know there's been protests, um, and I know that uh, certainly there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of anger in the Pittsburgh community over what happened. So uh, I think, you know, I mean, Rob's been playing this very well. Um, he's not, he's, he's exploiting this opportunity, this crisis as an opportunity, as he should, and it's, um, it seems to be so far going well. I don't know. Um, I'm sure a lot of people canceled their subscriptions. Um, I don't know if it's an organized thing. I know, for example, for a fact that in, in Los Angeles, they lost thousands of readers because of what happened to me. So I'm sure the same thing will happen in, in Rob's case, because he got even more PR than I did. Um, in, so uh, Julie, in terms of uh, doing a biography of Assange, uh, he, was, uh, my, he was my suggestion for my next uh, book. and. Um, my publisher shot it down because, quite frankly, he's uh, viewed on the left among liberals uh, as kind of divisive, and there's some people who buy into like the Russia Gate narrative who think that he played into that and like uh, flipped the election. Um, by the way, that's just not true. Uh, but he, but 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 there's so Assange is a controversial figure even on the left in a way that Snowden really was a little controversial, but not as much. And so just, I mean, okay, so this sucks, right? Like this, it sucks. Like, but you know, this is the problem with capitalism. Like if I lived in the Soviet Union, I could go to like uh, Gorbachev and say like, I would like to do a book about Julian Assange and you know, assuming that he, he, he knew who he was back then. And he, it's like, if it's approved, it's like, it becomes a guaranteed bestseller in state bookstores. But, but here, it's like, I've got to sell them. You know, and people often say like, oh, why don't you do a book about this and that? And I'm like, well, because people have to go to stores and pay money and buy them. And like, otherwise, like, I don't get any more books. I can do a book that I think is cool. I've done tons of, I've done 20 books. And uh, uh, some of them I did just because I thought they were cool. And then like after the cool book comes out and like it sold like nothing, the publisher goes, yeah, I lost like $40,000 on your cool book. So I'm never going to publish you again. So, so I, it sucks. It really does suck. If it were up to me, I'd do an Assange book tomorrow. Someone paid me the money to do it, I'd do it. But like, I don't think, I think my publisher is right. Like people, liberals wouldn't buy it. Like lefties would buy it. But liberals would, progressives would buy it. Um, and then in terms of the LAPD thing, um, so obviously it's very unwise to talk about pending litigation, so I'm going to do so at length now. Um, so the, the, uh, so, so basically, the, the short version of what happened, because it's not a short story, is that um, in, I was their cartoonist from 09 to 15 for six years. And um, at one point, they asked me to start doing a blog to go with the cartoon, to try to adjust to the new digital age. And um, so I did a cartoon about a new jaywalking crackdown in downtown LA that was disproportionately affecting people of color, where the LAPD were um, ticketing people pretty much because they were Latino or African American. And they we're talking about $197 fines, and this is a,